welcome back and thanks for requesting me. Hello! Thanks for the first time chat. We are playing Disco Elysium. I don't think we finished talking to this guy because I was like getting bored of him. Sure. So let's see here. What's on your mind? Yeah. Okay. What happened to the engineers? The company people? Oh, I'm afraid it didn't end well for the boys. But this story is a bit too dark for little Mikael here. Now, if you were to ask about tape computers... He means that the boys got shot by the communists. The boys were bourgeois. <laughs> I could be evil right now. Turn to Mikael. He means they all got shot in the head because they were bourgeoisie. Now, do you know what bourgeoisie is? Bourgeois. Bourgeoisie. Okay. Tape computers, right? Tape computers. He nods, wind tossing his suit jacket. What did the revolutionaries do with those advanced tape computers? They used them for military communications, but also to write and send out press releases. The most notorious example being Le Decret de Mars. What was that? What's the Mars Decree? I mean the radio transmission sent out to news agencies and world governments by the newly created Commune of Revachol on the 7th of March in the year 02. It's a beautiful piece of text actually. A singer-songwriter I know, Charette, called it a love poem to Revachol on her political concept album, Bon Bessier d'Anselin. You should read it. Every local library in Revachol stops a copy of the decree. I tried to get Mikhail to memorize it. Tried to. Someone was much too interested in worms to be paying any attention. The kid takes a peek at the green and silver worm on the cover of the book, already forgetting about this part of the discussion. How did those tape computers work? Did they work like radio computers? Actually, no one knows. No one even knows what a computer made entirely of tape would look like. But word has it, they were very elegant, exquisite, alien-looking, turn-of-the-century hardware. He raises his finger, remembering something. Ten years ago, I did a little... freelancing, I guess you could say. I was a special consultant for an exhibition at the Womty Domty Dom Center in Vedefort, Oran. It raised the same questions, and we had lengthy discussions with Paul Ockerman, who was head curator at the time. This was before the twins, Keith and Guy Jews, joined the team, trying to... Wait, did he just say Womty Domty Dom Center? He did it. He said... Wompty Dompty Dom Center, like it's the most natural thing in the world. Wompty Dompty Dom Center. What the hell is a Wompty Dompty Dom Center? And who the hell are Keith and Guy Juiced? Okay, the Wompty Dompty Center, Dom Center, Paul Ackerman, Keith and Guy Juiced, what are you talking about? The Wompty Dompty Dom Center for Contemporary Art. The exhibition itself to on Lagerman's notion of memory, and so there were some parallels. That's why the head curator, Paul Ackerman, chose to... Come on, there's no such place... No. You're making this up. Turn to the lieutenant. Kim, is he making this up? In fact, I'm not. The Wompty Dompty Dom Center is a place you can visit if you're ever in Vredeport and are ever in the market for an exhibition space slash contemporary art research center. He clears his throat. But perhaps I should return to the tape computers. As I was saying, the device itself was very elegant. Fragile, even. One could write directly on the tape using a special chemical solution. The machine would then analyze the handwriting, perform operations, and project output onto a white screen. It was a beautiful, delicate thing. Made of black film and folding tape structures. Nod. Cool. Very, very cool. Though I understand the socio-economic causes of the revolution, it pains me to imagine the revolutionary setting fire to this precious device. But so they did. The Feld Playback Experiment vanished into the fires of 07. Wait, the Feld Playback Experiment? Yes, the official name of the prototype. Some sources report it as the Feld Playback Experience. But those are incorrect. Why did the revolutionaries destroy it? Who knows? Maybe it was an accident, or maybe they didn't want the technology to end up in the wrong hands. Either way, they're all gone now. All three versions of the prototype. Nothing but debris and ashes remain inside that building. He takes a step back. The boardwalk creaks mournfully in the wind. I wanted to ask something what else. <laughs> what else? <laughs> you look like someone who has money. Do you have any money? 
I do have some money, yes, but that's not what's really important here. He brushes it off like it's not a, not a thing at all. He's not gonna give you money. What are you doing? Clearly you were just profiling. No, I mean, come on, you need the money. If it's not a thing, he can give you some. Could I have some of that unimportant money then? Oh no, I don't have it on me, officer. I was talking in more general terms. He looks uncomfortable, his left hand squeezing his son's shoulder. I'm just spending time with my kid here, showing him around the lesser known parts of our hometown. It wouldn't be wise to carry huge amounts of cash on such expeditions. Not that he would have to worry about being robbed. He looks surprisingly buff. Does he work out? By the way, do you work out? I do some Lomanthang stick fighting now and then. Wait, what's Lomanthang stick fighting? It's an anthropological heritage of the Lomanthang people. A martial art of sorts, but what not a lot of books mention is that it also carries a cultural significance among the Lomanthangs, as it used to be the best means of showing off to look for bride, which, interestingly enough, brings us to the socio-economic structure of the traditional rural tribes of the Lomantang Isles, which... He goes on to give you a detailed overview of their way of life, the amiable, slightly nervous smile not once leaving his face. Have fun getting dinner! But anyway, I'm boring you with details again. You will see. I'm not really interested in the practice, I just want to know how often you work out. Now and then, what's... that's like, what, once a week? Lomantang stick fighting is a little like a... They're all in addiction. I've been practicing it for nearly 20 years now, so you could say that my doses have grown a little peculiar. Wait, what does this man know about Corolidon addiction? So what is it, like twice a week then, every other day? Man, it is difficult to get people to stay on the right topic with you. Dad's fighting with sticks every night after dinner for four hours. He has a special room for that and a special costume. That's right, Mikhail. It also has a meditative quality. Helps to clear my head. But anyway. Thank you. Okay. We're still looking for those anthropologists, or those cryptozoologists, or whatever the fuck. The remaining windows rattle from a strong gust of wind. They're covered in a thick layer of grime. They must have been like this for 40 years. Try to see inside. Dripping water falls from a high place. All you can see is the shadow of a collapsing staircase. There's rust and corrosion on the bars. They're foaming with it. And a small layer of white salt from the sea. Lieutenant, can you make out what's inside? Point at the windows. No. I won't even try. You know, I had a partner once. They called him Eyes because he had to show me things. It's that bad. <laughs> this partner of his, eyes, things didn't end well. It saddens him to say his name. Don't even ask. He wouldn't answer. Maybe some other small talk. Can you still shoot, though? Well enough, actually. It's odd how that works. I'm no sharpshooter, but I pass my shooting courses seven out of ten. What's that? Buzz. Hmm. The electricity flows through the wires with audible power. Someone must have worked hard, hard to smash the plastic dome. A dead phone. A smashed receiver. Looks like someone hung up too far. Hard. Too far. <laughs> All right. Da, da, da. Sir. Yes. Okay, here's the church. There's boxes up there. We must turn back. <laughs> Is 
Is that a free coat? Someone has left an unidentifiable article of clothing on this railing. It smells really bad. Take a closer look. It's streaked with dried seagull shit and tangled with pieces of seaweed. A dangling arm suggests that there might be a jacket beneath the crust of filth. Please tell me you're not taking that with you. Why not? It's a guano encrusted jacket, and you're already carrying around enough as it is. Fine. <laughs> Makeshift roof. Fergants have tried to make the boardwalk habitable. That tarp will keep you out of neither rain nor snow nor wind. Postcard. A coin operated weighing machine. Hasn't been used for a decade. Some glasses. Vargants had painted the tarp red. Water drips from it. Or Vargants. Money. A big wine canister. It's open and empty. Hey, are you the cryptozoologist? Careful there, these floorboards are rotten and weak. The smell. It's awful and familiar. Hold your nose. Um, hold on. That is awful. It doesn't help. You can still smell it. What is it? Don't you recognize it? That idiot's pungency. That faintly cloying sweetness. Only death smells like that. Something cold wakes in the pit of your stomach. Fear. Heads up, Lieutenant. Something's not right here. The Lieutenant has already brought a handkerchief to his nose. There's some tear, an empty cigarette package, and a crumpled kebab wrapper in the trash bin. Examine the tear. Two empty bottles of Tallulah vodka and a can of black potent porter is all you find. No, there's more in there. Livis strawberry liquor, plus some Pilsner bottles, too. Better not pick them up. They seem unhygienic. A tragedy. Lieutenant looks at the can, eyes watering from the smell. He shakes his head with genuine sadness. Examine the cigarette package. Whoever tossed it here was a heavy smoker. The brand name reads Red Astra. Examine the kebab wrapper. You see traces of mayonnaise and ketchup on it, as well as a tomato wedge. The wrapper reads, Shish Kebab Revishol. It's no older than a day or two. No mold yet. It's hard to concentrate in the smell. The sea air brings some relief. Leave. Hey man, are you a cryptozoologist? A man lies on the boardwalk. His limbs bent and neck turned at an unnatural angle. Right next to him is an empty bottle of spirits. In his cramped hand, a chewing gum wrapper. Half of his body has slipped between the cracked boardwalk, starting with the right leg. The fall has left him broken, contorted like a sad puppet. The smell is not as bad as a two-week-old corpse, but it's definitely heading there. Hold on. Lividity is faintly pronounced. Whoever this is has been dead for two days. No longer. We need to investigate. Another dead body. This is your job. Steal yourself. Well, I sure hope it's not the cryptozoologist. Calm now. Carefully. Just another day. Just another dead body. Breathe. Study the man's clothes. He's wearing mud caked boots, beige trousers, and an old brown leather jacket with a bright blue lining. There are traces of kebab sauce on his chest. Search his pockets. You find some sunflower seeds and a rain-soaked library card folded into two. His jacket feels sodden and heavy under your hand. Good. We should take a look at that library card after this is done. Study the man himself. The man has fallen through a crack in the boardwalk and hit his head against the metal bench. Coagulated blood covers his black hair. One of his feet is still dangling through the hole. You have to be quite inebriated to fall that bad. Well over a liter of pure ethanol. Three bottles of wine, or one and a half of spirits. Examine his face. 
His expression is dull, like the sea behind him. Drops of water shining on his moustache. His eyes, empty and wide, look frightening in their frozen gaze. Height, 170 to 175 centimeters. Curly hair, stout build, aged approximately 50 to 60 years. He was confused when he died. Confused and alone, most likely. Overcome with the awful surprise of it all. Study the surroundings. There's some dried blood on the metal bench, right where the corpse's head rests. The floorboards are rotten and slippery wet around the hole. An empty bottle lies nearby. A chewing gum wrapper is clutched in his fist. Examine the chewing gum wrapper. Grabowski spearmint chewing gum. Green leaves on the cover. The man's mouth is half agape from the terror of the fall. Look in. The blackness of death. Stench. You think you see white chewing gum too? Confirmed. Mm -hmm. Nearly the whole pack is there. Solidified on his lower rear teeth. He ate the whole pack, right? It's to cover the smell of alcohol before going home. The worst thing is, I've seen it before. Almost the same scenario. Even the chewing gum. It's always the same. Examine the man's head. A dry chunk of blood covers the hair at the back of his head. An open wound. It's sticky and cold to your touch. I don't see any other major wounds, do you? It's hard to say. Seems like the head wound was spat at. It's exactly the shape of the bench. Step on the floorboards. They screech under your feet ominously. It's hard to say whether the dead man's weight was the cause of the boardwalk to break. It definitely looks fragile. You see waves churning below. Something cracks beneath your feet. He could have easily disappeared into the sea through that hole, and you would have never found him. Examine the bottle. A 0.75 litre Tallulah vodka with its cap missing. There's hardly anything left inside. It's mid-market spirits with a slight touch of menthol. The man meant to enjoy himself, have a good time. Tear all around us. He looks at two other bottles near the coin-operated viewer, then at your yellow plastic bag. I'd prefer if you didn't collect them this time. It's not proper. Fine. True. It feels disrespectful. Step back. The entire boardwalk creaks in the wind as you take a step back. Who is this man? Looks like one of the locals. He'd have to know this spot to come here. You don't just walk over here. He looks south the way you came. But that's just a lazy assumption. What do you think? At least this man knew how to party. Imagine the same scene without the bottom. Now that would be just sad. This is an omen. A sign from above. Don't start drinking again. He looks like me. I could have ended up just like him. Dead on some empty boardwalk with a bottle next to my corpse. Well, at least you're Ouch. The lieutenant points to the ring on the man's left hand. The flesh around it is swollen and gray. Or, what if you are? But let's try to not run ahead. For now, all we know is that he's an unidentified middle-aged man on bed on the Martinez boardwalk. What do you think happened here? Death by misadventure. He slipped and fell through the boardwalk. A truly unfortunate accident. Do you think if he was- If it wouldn't have been for that bench, he'd be alive. Do you think he was drunk? Pointed the bottle. Oh, yes. What about alcohol poisoning and liver failure? Some symptoms of acute alcohol poisoning could have definitely played a role here. Severe confusion, respiratory depression, unpredictable behavior. But I think that death arrived through head trauma, not liver failure. Could it be related to the lynching? No, I don't see anything that points in that direction. For now, let's treat this case as a simple, albeit sad, accident. And related to the murder case. What about the kebab? What about it? The deceased ate some kebab. It's probably from a nearby place, maybe in the box. Someone should be held responsible for this broken boardwalk. It's dangerous. We'll seal this place off after the news reaches the coalition officials. I doubt that they have enough resources to actually repair the boardwalk. Not that sealing it off would keep anyone away. All it does is keep the city council's hands clean. He smiles sourly. Right. 
It does seem to be a pretty straightforward misadventure. Although there's still a question of identifying the body. What should we do with him? From where I stand, I can see two options. We either take the case and follow the leads to identify the body on our own, or we report back to the station and leave this for our colleagues to handle it. I want some more time no to decide. To rush. He's wearing only good. We should take a look at that library card. Yeah, that's what I wanted to do. Items. Postcard. The library count card found from a pocket of a dead man of the Martinis boardwalk. It's slightly damp to the touch. The cover bears the stamp of Jamrock Public Library. Whoops. Wrong button. The library card is folded into two and still slightly wet to the touch. The front side reads, Central Jamrock Public Library Card, issued to Billy Mejor, expires July 53. Look inside. Whoever owns this card is an avid reader. You find a list of books written in blue pencil. Radio Thriller. Stand a little less between me and the sun. The last one in the list is The Glinton Curve by M. Theobald. A library stamp indicates that the book has been returned. Most of these titles seem to be in the sci-fi genre. Some thrillers, too. Look at the back side. If lost, please return the card to the library. Dial 005 0255211 or visit us at Moreau Street, 78 Jamrock. Business hours 900 to 1800. We should first decide what to do with the body before taking any other actions. Let's take another look at the body and talk things through. The coin-operated viewer has been out of order for years. A man lies on the boardwalk. What should we do with From him? Where I stand, Let's take the case. We much. found him. We should finish those. All right. We've already examined the library card. Let's call the Jamrock Library from my kinema. See if we can learn anything about this Billy Mejean. And while we're there, we should also call the station. Let them know that we are taking the case. Okay, the library is closed right now, so... Moonshine probably smells like tasty fermentation. But where's the cryptozoologist? How did I get over here? Oh, I see. Perhaps they are this way. Hmm. Ooh, what's that? Well, examine it, would you? Two bucks, baby. I think I was too worried to open this door. Warned by elements, guards the depot. Cigarette butts cleaned away under a rock. Brand Tio Mortiri. You take a mental note. Tio Mortiri seems important somehow. Someone's made a campfire here a long time ago. Arrested broken control box for the radio relay tower. 
The ladder is too rusty to climb. The sea air has eaten away at it. This relay tower coordinates boat traffic in the bay, barely. Is that a scented scarf? Okay. Tiny inlets off in the distance where the posts trail forward. Trail towards, sorry. Let's take a look at our scented scarf. Might be better than our terrible necktie. Okay, let's see. Never mind. I don't like when the clothes take away points from me. Seagull! Ah, ah. Okay. The boardwalk rises to your s south. It casts a long shadow over you. Do I have drift going on? Is that why this is happening? This is my pro controller. A shirt! A white polo shirt. Rhetoric. Dude, where's the cryptozoologist? I need to know. Welcome back with dinner! What'd you get? Sorry, that was kind of slow. <laughs> slow reaction time. Chili and rice. Looking back at you from the rust-colored water. You. Okay, thank you. <laughs> I love rice. Rice is so good. Been over here yet? I don't think we have. No, this is where that guy is. Yeah, okay. Are you the cryptozoologist? At last. Dude, your wife's been looking for you. Tiny cages, carefully constructed. Here we go. Nice and easy. No way out, little guys. Not out of this gym. There's a cylinder on the ground in which the man is arranging some netting. It looks like some kind of trap. He notices you. Who's there? Oh, the police. Hello, officers. Is that the police? Why are the police here? Don't worry, Gary. I'll handle it. You must be Morel, the cryptozoologist. To what do I owe the pleasure? Your wife misses you. That's sarcasm. He takes no pleasure from your appearance. Lena sent me. She's been really worried about you and is waiting for you to get back. <sighs> of course. Thank you for passing along the message. That damn water lock is broken. We can't go all the way around the 881. <laughs> the water lock's been fixed. It was fine when I crossed it. Withhold the whole story. Oh, good. We should really be getting back. Gary could use a hot shower and a warm bib. Did he say we can go back now? 
Yes, Gary. We can go soon. If you see Lena, tell her I won't be long. Sir, your wife is waiting for you. I just have to do one more round. See if the phasmid has taken the bait. Then we go in. He refastens a bit of netting that has come loose in the wind. Let's see. Tell me more about this phasmid you're looking for. Hmm. Well, first of all, it's damn difficult to find, which is why we've been knee deep in the reeds laying traps for it. What makes it so difficult to find? Good question. Being a phasmid of the order Phantasmodea, a ghost insect, it disguises itself as plant matter. In this case, the reeds. Awful lot of reeds around, aren't they? And I suspect it may have also developed other specialized techniques to protect itself from predators, or scientists, in our present case. What sort of specialized techniques has the phasmid been using to hide itself? It's my hypothesis that it has evolved certain electrochemical defenses that allow it to interfere with animal perception. Impeding pattern recognition, confusing the visual cortex. All right, now you're just getting out there. But I cannot describe how these defenses work, much less how they evolve, without studying a live specimen. Yes, it makes perfect sense. You're beginning to suspect there's something parametric about this phasmid. A ghost insect, he said. These people are looking for a ghost. How big is the phasmid? I'm expecting it to be quite giant. One known species of phasmid called the Megaphasmodea zoensis is about the size of a grown man's forearm. So, uh... Is that a real creature? Hold on, I'm gonna Google it. Megaphasmodea z... Onesis. Apparently there's like some kind of stick bug that's really large. But I'm not seeing if it's a real thing. Um, Megaphasma, a genus of walking stick bugs. How big is it? This Wikipedia article is so tiny. Se seven inches, it can be seven inches long. That's, that's kind of, that's not as big as a forearm, is it? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, I guess, I guess, I guess so. <laughs> okay, let's see. Why are you so interested in this stick bug? Aren't there more sensational animals out there? Typical rookie assumption. Insects are much more sophisticated creatures than those unversed in zoology give them credit for. Even simply catching a glimpse of the Insulindian phasmid would be the apex of my, of any cryptozoologist's career. But to study it and its defenses, find out how it stayed hidden so long. He shakes his head. Would be glory itself. What have you discovered about it so far? Very little, I'm sorry to say. No one's ever captured a specimen, so all our information is based on first and third hand accounts. So no one's ever found one? Not yet. That's what makes it a cryptid. Um, just out of curiosity, if there's no proof of its existence, how do you know it's real? Shut up, Kim, I think it's real. I know it's real. The cryptozoologist says brusquely enough that he even seems taken aback by it. It's clear that his obsession with the phasmid is driven by something more than the pure pursuit of scientific advancement. By which I mean, I've heard enough first-hand accounts to believe quite firmly that the Insulindian phasmid 
is more than mere superstition. Let's see. Hmm. I think it's real. I think it's out here. What would it be like the grassman hold on to something next to you or just behind you, like a trace of vapor you exhaled one spring morning as a child? This is what he's searching for. A spectre. Lena said there's been a sighting of it here in Martinet. Yes. The most recent sight of was by a couple of teenagers along the coast here. That's what brought us to Martin A specifically. It's the first credible sighting in several decades. Admittedly, it's an unusual location for this species, but with all the sewage runoff upstream, it probably doesn't matter much anymore. Maybe the Insulindian Phasmid has died out? I have to resist the thought. Such an extraordinary creature is doubtlessly highly resilient. After all, it's generally thought to be capable of parthenogenesis. Oh my god. Parthenogenesis. Asexual reproduction in which a female can produce an embryo without fertilizing an egg with sperm. Oh, so it's like one of those lizards that lays a bunch of eggs and makes clones of shit. I've seen that. There's this lizard who just fucking clones itself. Like, this guy had a lizard and it just fucking multiplied by itself. So, you know, just girly things. Um. Parthenogenesis? Yes. The females don't need males to reproduce. It makes it easier for a species to survive in adverse conditions. That's pretty clever. Yes. The Insulindian phasmid is a very clever insect. That's why it's so damn difficult to catch. But as a scientist, I'll try my best to remain dispassionate. You're not remaining dispassionate, sir. Tell me more about these traps. Well, they may not look impressive, but Lena designed them quite cleverly. So I'm sure they'll do the trick. Lena designed the traps? Yes. He says with some pride. How do the traps work? Simple. Attracted by the locusts, the phasmid crawls down the funnel and, having eaten its fill, can get back out. At least, that's the intention. The net isn't a perfect solution, but we didn't want to use anything that might damage the specimen's delicate exoskeleton. What are you using as bait? He just told us. Locusts. Nearly all known phasmids are herbivores, of course. But we've hypothesized that the Insulindian phasmid might occasionally prey on other insects. Inside the traps, a number of locusts crawl and tumble over one another in a tiny, chittering swarm. Hey, Raven Moon! Nuzzle, 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 nuzzle. <laughs> what will you do if these traps don't work? They'll work, I assure you. The predatory hypothesis, using locusts as bait, accounts for the failure of previous efforts by other teams, which use plants. We have given this some thought. Let me ask you about something else. Yes. What? Lena seems pretty eager for your return. And I'm eager to return to her, I assure you. But I can't leave before we finish with these traps. My wife understands that. Just as well as anyone. He looks south where Lena would be. Come on, Morel. We've been soaking out here for days. It's time to go back. Be quiet, Gary. And leave the traps? Absolutely not. I won't let Lena down. Come on, she wants us back. I'm soaked up to my nuts over here. 
We'll both catch weed crabs if we don't dry out soon. Well, let me lay that down. Sounds like the cryptozoologist's wife shares a special connection to the Phasmid summit. I didn't know the Phasmid was so important to Lena. Of course it's important to her. She's seen it. A verified sight on record. One of only 40 century, and it's hers. Really? She'd sighted the Phasmid? She didn't tell me that. Yes. That's how we first came to know one another, in fact. But that's her story to tell, not mine. <laughs> Needless to say, you must ask her about the mysterious Phasmid. Suffice to say, it's long been our dream to find proof of the Insulindian Phasmid together. I can't abandon course now. Okay, I understand. I don't give up on things either. Good. A good quality to have. Both for a police officer and an experimental zoologist. What if we check the traps for you? We didn't expect you to take such an interest in our work here, officer. I'm all in with this cryptid shit. I'm hooked. Caught the bug, I see. It's easier to get caught up in the search than you'd imagine. Where are these traps? There are four in total. One is to the south, on this little peninsula. By the boathouses there. It's very near. Another we set in Land's End, to the northeast. It's behind a small sand dune there. On your way to the old radio tower. After the church, the third is set near the canal, where you crossed, by a concrete slab. A big thicket of reeds going up the slope, and among them, you should check at least one of those before returning to this one, since I just said it. This one's more of a technicality, but still, better safe and stupid than sorry. What do I do if there's a fastmid in one of the traps? Bring it to me at once. Make sure the trap is closed tight. He's not comfortable with the possibility that you'll claim the find, but he's lying about this even to himself. What if I encounter the Fastman in the wild? That's highly unlikely, officer. And in the event you do, he I'll takes spray out a you with the pheromone mixture I developed. It's made of musk and research chemicals. The pheromone should attract the insect to you, or at least prevent it from bolting at the sight of you. It's quite potent. Will last you about a week. Lay it on me, thick. Present your armpit. He douses you with the odd-smelling spray, a double helping as you present your other armpit, and then gives you a satisfied nod. I hope you're not buying this. It dispenses it with. Shut up, Kim. Canister, so it would be precious like holy water. It is precious. A single dose cost me fifty real to develop. Not that I expect you to understand self-financing one's own research. He looks at the lieutenant with disdain and then puts the spray back in his pocket. I'm ready. Let's get to it. Right. Which means you two can pack up and go back to the wording. Whatever he thinks about this detour, it's clear that these men are exhausted and in need of assistance. Finally! Someone's talking sense. Thank you for your help. Gary and I will start breaking down camp. If you have any more questions, now's the time to ask. We'll be gone once you get to it. If it's more cryptid-related business you want to discuss, you'll have time for that later, too. But what if the information is vital on the hunt? How did you become a cryptozoologist? I've just always liked animals and puzzles. Searching for cryptids is a bit of both. So you're living your childhood dream out here. It's not Charles play. Just because I have to trade through the mud every so often. His eyes narrow. Why not just be a zoologist? Real animals are puzzling too. Real? I know you think one is a respectable profession, while the other is superstition. Everyone does. I don't. It's a profession like every any other. Indeed. My methods do not differ from other scientists. I simply draw upon a wider variety of evidence. And I have more hope that something truly surprising might happen. And has anything truly surprising ever happened to you? No, 
As I said, I have yet to catch a cryptid. Although I have come close. Close enough to keep trying. That's not what he that's not what the text says. Hmm. Hmm. Interesting. Something for later. This close call. What kinds of evidence do you use? Everything from forgotten regional law to newspaper accounts. Like the one that brought us here. To look for the phasmin. And I'll keep a very open mind. He's interested in things that people believe that scientists don't. You think other scientists don't listen to ordinary people enough? Most establishment scientists only care about reputation and remuneration. Not real research. And certainly not the truth. They're a cowardly lot. And both the field and basement archives can be dangerous places. So you've never discovered a cryptid? No. Very few cryptids are ever discovered. And not for a lack of trying. To stay hidden is a cryptid's primary quality. It's even in the name, cryptid. So how many cryptids have been found? Of the list of cryptids kept by the Cryptozoological Society of Chemni, which is 4,082 items long, about 2,000 have been confirmed as hoaxes. Two are categorized as confirmed discoveries. The rest are in differing stages of discovery, refutation, and data collection. Only two have been proven to be real? Yes. The Chateau Quan Forest Pygmy, who turned out to be an extinct species of primate, and a cave salamander from Hugo Grad, who is, honestly, quite unremarkable. It's in a zoo somewhere. Oh, don't call it that. We cryptozoologists are brutally honest with ourselves. More so even than the public. With cryptids, most cryptids are hoaxes or they are never found. That does not mean we should stop searching. Not approvingly. Then the Insulandian Pathasmid will be the third. Indeed. If our expedition is successful, every paper in the world will report on it. From Revachol to Dushan too. It will be a zoological miracle. Thanks for explaining that. Now about something else. Yes? Let's talk about specific cryptids. Alright. What cryptids precisely? I usually discuss these things with specialists, so I don't know what. We would have to discuss. He wants to say, but decides against it, since you've offered to help. You need to ask him about specific cryptids. Cryptids you've heard about from Lena, or his friend Gary. He won't just talk. Which cryptid did you almost catch? You said before that you almost caught one. A willow person. It's a long story. One non-specialist would find rather dull. A willow person. Willow people? Not at all. What are willow people? They're not people, really. Some argue they aren't really animals. As they seem to have evolved directly from trees. He says it in a self-explanatory, everyday They're very, manner. very thin. Almost flat, in fact, and can camouflage themselves easily, wrapping themselves around trees and blending in with the tree bark. In that way, they're not too dissimilar from the phasmid we're looking for here. Wait, so I may have seen these willow people without knowing it? You probably have. How did you almost catch a willow person? Gary and I painted an entire grove's worth of trees in slow drying paint. It was a bright lavender color was hoping one of the willow people would get pain on it and not be able to camouflage itself. After waiting in hiding for hours, I saw a figure slip from one of the trees, a lavender shadow dashing through the grove. And then? I chased it with a knit. Not very elegant. You can't be elegant in the field. And, well, it was faster than me. A lavender shadow. He smirks. I well, know you think we were snacking on funny mushrooms. It's easier to mock someone than to admit that the world might be more interesting than you'd imagined. Furthermore, I'm not saying it was a confirmed sighting. I'm painfully aware of what goes into verifying such things. There is a serious possibility that I saw a squirrel or a trick of the light. 
I am my own harshest critic. He makes it a real point here to sound falsifiable. And Lena's sighting of the Phasmid, is that...? Confirmed. It's 100% verified and meets all the standards of an authentic cryptid sighting. Just tell me about a cool cryptid. Any cryptid. No offence, officer, but I'm not much of a pedagogue. I don't know what I would have done if Lena hadn't persuaded me to go back to field research. You should ask her if you want interesting stories. Okay. Me? Not a people person. Unless you haven't noticed. And I don't make a good lecturer. My strength lies in field work and persistence. He brushes an errant strand of hair from his eye. Oh, thanks, Suna! Woo. Woo. <laughs> Welcome on in. Enough tales, then. Let's change the subject. By all means. I'll get going. These soggy logs smell of ignition fluid. They still won't light, won't light up. These heavy military blockades are riddled with bullet holes crumbling. A buoy bobs in the water. The number on it says 11. That patch of reeds over there. It's a great place to hide something. Kind of out of the way. Being so close to the water. What's this about? Nothing. Just a hunch. The hunch passes, leaving you there by the old boy. Bo okay. It's almost impossible to get a fire going near this near to the ocean. What is that? A can. Nice. Hey, Gary. Hello, I'm Gary. Very generous of you to help us out, officer. Yellow man. I mean, officer. <laughs> Yellow man. Wait. No, wait, that was racist. <laughs> I thought Kim's coat was yellow. I'm like, yellow. No, he's orange. The lieutenant raises his eyebrows slightly and takes out his notebook. Damn, Gary, what the fuck, man? I'm just waiting for my friend Morel to finish up with his insect traps so we can return to civilization. Not a lover of the great outdoors? I like nature, just not this bloody coast. It's mostly drunks and degenerates that come here. Degenerates? This man respects authority too much. To see the truth inscribed on thine own visage. Pretend thou art the paragon of virtue. Sadly, I might be a drunk or a degenerate, maybe even both. Dark times will do that to good men. He nods gravely, then shifts his gaze to the pile of soggy logs at his feet. Serious question time. This man is no innocent. No one is. Do you know anything about the hanged man behind the whirling in rags? Oh, so that's what the RCM in Martinez is about. Great. Great to hear someone's finally taken care of that. So you do know something about it? No, no. Nothing. He was some kind of mercenary. But everyone here knows that. I'm just glad to hear you're looking into it. That's all. Yeah, I... Yeah. I've been looking into it. I haven't been screwing around or anything, you know? He didn't kill him or anything. But there's something going on. Are you a cryptozoologist too? No, no. I help Morel with research sometimes, and I've learned some things along the way. But I don't usually go in for picnics like this on my own. After all this time with Morel, he must have an opinion on cryptids. This could lead to a good one. I'm into cryptids. Do you have a favorite? Oh, yes. The burning rhino. Morel doubts he's real, but I don't much care. Because I won't be the one looking for it out in Sopper Serac. What's a burning rhino? A rhinoceros that looks ordinary during the day, but burns brightly by night. Well, at least the males do. How do they burn? They have special ducts just above their shoulder blades that secrete a combustible fluid. When the rhino is just beginning to light itself, 
It looks as though it has wings of fire. Why only the males? The flames are not just for decoration. They are an integral part of the beast's mating behavior. How so? During the burning rhino's mating season, herds of male rhinos, all aflame, encircle herds of female rhinos, forming a fiery ring as they begin to copulate loudly. Local peasants call it the passion ring. They fear the rhinos, as perhaps they should. Anyway. The lieutenant sighs without looking up from his notes. It's clear the burning rhino is dear to him on many levels. Some even spiritual. You were surprised to see my colleague Lieutenant Kitsuragi. Not many Seolites here, or anywhere, other than Seo. I meant no offense, truly. Lieutenant is a native of Revachal. Oh, yes. Of course he is. I was just speaking about his connections. Let's change the subject, okay? I'm watching you, Gary. Thank you for your cooperation. Hey man, turn me, tell me about the burning rhinos. Oh my god. We'll be on our way soon. Okay. Layman? Your friend you Gary told me about the burning yourself. rhino. Really? That one's a hoax. Some Seroese rice farmers set fire to rhinoceros cadavers and use them to scare tourists. Have you told Gary this? Many times. It always turns into an argument. I don't want to repeat it. The rhino holds a special place in his heart. Let it. Myths are part of my field. What if the other cryptids are hoaxes too? Many of them probably are. Statistically speaking, about 20% of all cryptids are verified hoaxes. And covering falsehoods deliberately fabricated to fool the public. It's just as much my calling as finding new species. If perhaps slightly less enjoyable. See, Cam, one of them is a hoax. Which one? He hasn't been paying attention. The burning rhinoceros. Mm -hmm. The burning rhino is where to draw the line. He's unimpressed. I knew it can't be real. Did you? It is almost as difficult to confirm a hoax. So it is to confirm a signing. <coughs> Enough tales then, let's change the subject. By all means. Alright, I'll get going. Let's see here. Inspect the traps, okay. Five cents, baby. No boat in the boat house, boat house today. Got some sunglasses. Oh. Damn it. There's a trap in the reeds at your feet. Looks like the same one you saw Morel set before. Same mesh, same wiring. Look around. Behind you, the ruins of a residential building rise over the reeds, shielding them from the wind. The reeds rustle confidently. Reach for the trap. Locusts are crawling around in the trap, confused but uneaten. You see no carnivorous reed phasmid gorging on them. Big surprise. Anyway, one down, three to go. Damn, I was hoping it'd be in the first one. No, you weren't. 
Whatever, Kim. The boathouse is shoddily constructed. A strong breeze might blow it over. Ancient paint is peeling off the roof of the shaded bench, covered in rust. A scattering of bullet holes is spread across the cracked wall, reaching from one corner to the other. Look, Kim, even more bullet holes. Something definitely gone down something's definitely gone down here. Hmm. Correct. The density of the bullet holes is unusual. Even in a general average bullet hole frequency not in any sense. Grim affairs. Meaning this is a lot of bullet holes. Looks like fully automatic rifle fire. Something you don't see these days. Why not? The manufacturing and sale of automatic rifles was curtailed after the revolution. The destructive power of such tools proved to be too much. We do need to retain some humanity in the world. A row of ghostly shades stand facing the wall. There are many of them. A dozen at least. The heads lowered and eyes blindfolded. It's quiet. No sound. No movement. Ten meters away, other shades are lined up in an orderly manner. Automatic rifles prime. A gust of wind blows by. The coats of the firing squad flap slowly in the breeze. A single person stands on the side. A long time has passed since the moment of this fusillade. Rain and brine have since washed all the blood away. Not a trace remains. What is this? The abundance of bullet holes leads to two options. Either an inordinate amount of executions were performed here, or they did not use a conscience round, where only one soldier has the loaded rifle. Looks like this was a mass execution with everyone fully armed. Look at the people against the wall. A host of men, probably in everyday clothes, ragged from the conflict and covered in dust. They were not sitting, a common practice for executions in some nations as demonstrated by the height level of the bullet holes. They stand, facing the wall. It's impossible to discern any details about their personality or background. Ordinary people, familiar, each and every one of them. Who were they? Comrades, the forsaken, the wretched, who tried to rise against the horrors of the world. Look at the line of soldiers. Seven men in combat uniforms and dark coats holding automatic rifles aimed at the people. Soldiers from some side, but from which one? Look at the person standing on the side. The commandant, the one who gives the order. Machine gun fire crackling through the air. The lights of the muzzle flashes dancing on his face. Kim, who was in this execution? I don't know. I don't know who died here, lying up beside that horrible wall. It could have been any of the parties involved in the revolution. Perhaps the ones executed here were the loyalist conservatives killed by the communists at the start of the civil war. Or it could have been the communists put to death during the last stretch of the conflict by the coalition forces. Remember what Trent Heidelstam said about Feld? What if it was the Feld personnel when their assets were being seized by the revolutionaries? Another likely scenario. Lieutenant nods. Or maybe. You mentioned the coalition forces. Could it have been them against the wall? Yeah. It's very unlikely the coalition forces Hi, were the ones who died here. They were always the last ones against the wall. To be honest, if a coalition member was anyone in this situation, it was a commandant, the superior giving the orders. Goodbye. A cold sea wind blows away the figures. Yeah, a little tired, but that's usual. Sign says entry interdate. An old ticket taker booth, no longer in operation. People paid money to park here. No one would pay now. Oh, there could be stuff in that box. Me in, me in.
Have a nice sleep. Bye bye. Thanks for stopping. Money. There's another box. The door is not only barred shut, it's inaccessible. Oh, you missed the disco? We we did make a disco. God damn it. I just want something that doesn't take away my stats. I need all my stats up. I'm just a silly little guy. section of the coast hasn't been used in decades. Um, I was not able to- I was not confident in my disco moves. I thought it looked like I was gonna fail that check. All oh, those guys are gone. They must have gone home, it's kind of late. I would have embarrassed myself in front of the teens. Here, the disc goes in here. See, impossible. I've been meaning to ask you, what's with the hair? It's to express my individuality. Is that a bald spot? It's hard to tell for sure, with the fused together spikes, but it looks like he's bald. Fair enough. Maybe it was a bad idea. Anyway. Goodbye, officer. But yeah. Yeah, I don't know how to dance either. <laughs> I ain't a dancer. I just sway around a little bit. <laughs> okay, I think there's supposed to be a trap up here. from here. I see the locusts are moving. Would you look at the trap, sir? A familiar apparatus lies among the reeds. Another one of Morel's traps, weighed down by stones to keep it in place. Look around. The reeds sway in the coastal breeze. They seem to be waiting for something. The wind picks up air near the cape's end, surrounding the narrow strip of land from three cardinal directions. It's cold for this time of year. Reach for the trap. 
This trap is also full of panicked locusts. No sign of any cryptozoological beast inside. Damn it. Another empty trap. The lieutenant takes note. More out of habit than duty. Let's keep going. The next one is the lucky one. Yep. The next one has a crab trap in it. These are just crab traps. You do realize? Be quiet, Kim. I believe in the weird stick bug. Okay. Okay. Near the canal you cross southeast of the village. Ooh, Kim, you're gonna be sorry when I find that bug. I may have embarrassed myself multiple times and have been the most fail cop there has ever been. However, I'm right when it comes to this bug, I think. Did I say southeast or southwest? Never eat soggy waffles. This is west. Southeast of the village. Oh, money. Nice. Birds in the birch tree, barely audible coos come from above. Jammy time. Thank you. This way, perhaps. some cop sunnies. Thank you. I also like my pajamas. <laughs> oh. There it is. This trap's not too hard to spot. Once you know what to look for, keeping it hidden has not been a priority for the cryptozoologist. Look around. The reeds bend forlornly toward the water. Some tufts have been crushed. The broken stalks sickly pale against the darkness. In the east, the city center hums to you. The constant distant song. 
Louder on this part of the coast. Nearer somehow. And there's the cold again. Always the cold. You should get them, Harris. I like to wear like big t-shirts for pajamas, like large t-shirts, or just a shirt. Nothing but locusts in this trap as well. Definitely no cryptozoological monstrosity. Man. Empty as all of them. One more of these and we're done. His face is red from the cold sea air. He crouches to catch his breath. Bummer it wasn't in here. I'm just glad we haven't found some poor cat trapped in one of these. Leave. Okay. Now we have to go back. Ah! Yeah, and clothes are, like, so expensive, too. Like, ugh. I just got a couple of cute clothes in the mail the other day. Um, I got a new cardigan. It reminded me of my wife! It's got, like, a bunch of eyes all over it. Okay, it's, like, this way, right? And then this way. Not this way, this way. I wore it today, group. I'm gonna be so disappointed if it's not in here. I better save my game. What if there's a skill check? I will save scum to find the bug. <laughs> yeah, sometimes things like aren't flattering on the body either. Like, it's a bummer. Sir, if you don't check that trap. This is the last of the traps. The one Morel just set. Checking it over. He said is just a technicality. Look around. The reeds hiss and shake in the darkness. That is settled over the abandoned camp. The later it gets, the colder. Remnants of the camp can still be seen in the sand. The fire that's gone out. You feel strange somehow. I totally know what you mean. Like, some, like it's hard building an outfit. Like, ugh. I would start with some basics, like just like white socks, black socks. Cause like, I feel like you can pair those with most things. And then like a good pair of shoes. The trap feels light and silent. <gasps> Pick it up. Something is different here. No locusts. No locusts! Kim! No phasmid either, but still. Look closer still. Well, the bait worked on something. This doesn't mean it was a reed monster, though. Kim, be quiet. Unless you see one in there? I just see an empty trap. The netting is a little untidy. Messier than the others. Like someone or something picked the trap up and shook it before dropping it back down. Actually, I do get the feeling that someone or something may have messed with the trap. Perhaps our cryptozoologists have competition in the form of an actual entomologist, or someone else is sabotaging them. I could present more theories, but then I would be taking this on as a case, which I am not. But what if it was the Phasmid? What if it ate them and got out? Right. Anyway, that's for the cryptozoologists to figure out now. We are not cryptozoologists. We are cops. Grey goes with a lot of things, too. The reeds hiss and shake in the darkness. Let us settle over the abandoned camp. The later it gets, the colder. The reeds, the later it gets. Aw oh, man, no bug. This sucks. Hello. Can't believe we didn't find a bug, I hate it here. Is it late enough to go to bed? What time do they go to bed? 22. The door has seen better days. I'll wait outside to give you some time and privacy to check out your new living arrangement. But just so you know, after we are done with the day, I'll still be staying in the whirling ranks for the night. We'll meet in front of the shack in the morning. 
Okay. The key turns with a satisfying click. You can enter the shack now. I hope there's a bed in here. Oh, thank God. Old science fiction magazines, books about bird watching, an almanac from 38. The intricate heat engine hums quietly, giving out a pleasant warmth. The floorboards creak under your step. On the table, you see a bowl of water, a rough soap, and next to it, a small hand mirror. A straight razor soaks inside the wash basin. Is shaving the right call? The water reflects back a vague image of your face. Nose bulbous and red, hair unkempt, wrinkles lining the eyes and forehead. The stash is gigantic. I don't know about this. An old mirror hangs on the wall. You see the reflection of your face in it. Let the mirror be. <laughs> A jacket. You see the waves, a sea, a church. Or the sea, that is. The bed is comforting, if a bit run down. Still, you've earned a rest. It's no time to rest yet. Apparently. What if... Is he gonna shave the... Because if he shaves the whole thing off, I don't want to shave the whole thing off. Like, what if he just cleans himself up a little bit? You see a bowl of water. Your hand trembles as you scratch your cheek. Oh no, that's not how a grown man shaves. This isn't hard sharp enough. Scrape harder. Stop for crying out loud. You're gonna cut your own throat. I need to shave the chops. Your hand refuses to move another minute. A small trickle of blood runs down your cheek. Damn. I want to see. I want to see if he, like, cleans up. I got questions. On the table, you see a bowl of water. Your hand trembles as you scratch your cheek. Oh, See a bowl of water, like an artist with a brush or a master swordsman. You used a small mirror and a straight razor with some soap to remove all that unkempt hair from below the nose line. The sharp blade chips it, uh, producing a scratching sound. Uh, the surface underneath the bed feels tender. The air brushing against it, chill. Feel your clean shaven cheeks. They feel so smooth, surprisingly so. A feeling of freshness overcomes you, as if you just came from a cold bath. Was shaving the right call? The water reflects back a vague image of your clean-shaven face. This- I don't like it. I don't like it. Put it back. I don't like it. I just wanted him to get a little cleaned up. Just a little bit. Not- I didn't want him to take the whole thing off. I thought he could use a trim. Anyways, off we go. We have to talk to the cryptozoologist. One of the traps. I feel like we haven't been over here in like forever.
No, 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 not that. Examine it, damn you. Scribbled between the thighs of page three girl. Lorge de disco. Lorge and de disco, okay. And we got a call, but people let them know we're doing Inside, a case. You see a set of steering levers, a radio microphone, a pull out toolbox. Pick up the radio. This is precinct 57. How may I assist you? I need to report a dead body on the Martinese boardwalk. One moment. You hear the, her shuffling through some papers. Can you please describe the body? A sex cause of death? An unidentified middle aged man, height 170 to 175 centimeters, dark hair, medium build, looks like he slipped and fell through a hole in the boardwalk and hit his head against the metal bench. We suspect he might have been inebriated when he fell. There were bottles all around him and traces of vomit on his shirt. Any signs of violence? No, it seems like it was an accident. No field autopsy necessary. You can hear her quickly typing in the background. What about his belongings? Did you examine his clothes? He was wearing boots, trousers, and an old leather jacket with a bright blue lining. I found a library card from his pockets. Any information on the library card? It's from Central Jamrock Public Library. It belongs to someone named Billy Magine. Good. You have a lead. Do you and Luz Donkey Kuragi want to take the case, or should I assign it to someone else? We're taking the case! I have assigned the case to Luz Donkey Kuragi. Please follow up on this library lead to identify the man. We'll send someone to take the body to the morgue. That's all for now. Thank you for reporting in. Is there anything else I can do for you? Did you find out more about the owner of the armored boots? Sorry, sir. I still haven't heard back from okay. the database people. Try calling again later. Is there anything else I can do for you? Okay, so I'm pretty sure they're not going to answer because, like, the library card said, like, the hours were, like, off, but we'll try it anyways. Connect me to the Jamrock Public Library. I'm afraid they're closed. Damn. It says here that the library is open from 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. Thank you. You should try again during business hours. Anything else, detective? I'm done with the radio for now. 57, over and out. In the cabin, you see a set of steering wheels. Now that our save slots are full, we don't have auto save, so I, I'm trying to save every so often. Look at all these people. Hey, man. It's great to see you again, officer. My wife can't wait to thank you. Go on, talk to her. Okay. Hey, girl. Oh, sweetie, I don't even know how to thank you for finding my husband and helping him out. I hope we haven't been too much trouble for you. Just doing my job, ma'am. Here, I want to give you a small token of my gratitude. It's a tie. Mask in origin. The pin is an antique. Quite special. The little silvery knob holding the tie together feels warm in your hair. It's in the shape of an avian skull with eight eyes. You never told me you'd seen the Phasmid. Oh, you don't want to hear about some old woman's ramblings. Ramblings? Nonsense. Your description of the Phasmid is the most precise I've ever heard. But darling, I didn't even get the size of it right. You were a child, my dear. Really. It's extraordinary what you were able to describe. Now go on. Tell our friend about it. He's proven his interest in the field. Reflexively. The lieutenant read his, his familiar notebook. Well, it was summer. I was building a racing track out of sand on the beach near a tall stand of reeds. Quite a tall one. Many times my height, I remember. When, all of a sudden... What happened? I looked up, and one of the reeds moved. Not like a plant, but like a living thing. It stood up and looked at me. Its body unfolded like some antique toy. I've never seen anything like it. The reeds turned into a creature. I didn't know this can happen, so I reached my arm and touched the thing. It felt just like a stalk of reed, but it moved, swaying, towering above me. 
after a while, 20 seconds, a minute maybe, left, went into the reeds. Did you follow it? I tried, but I was only a child. There was mud and high water. I couldn't see it anymore. I was just standing there, knee deep in mud, looking around me. Where did you go? Don't go. Then what? I ran back home to my grandmother and asked her if reeds could walk and told her they were looking at me. <laughs> of course, she just laughed at me, but I knew what I'd seen. For years, it was a story I told at parties when I wanted to impress boys, that sort of thing. Of course, most people just took it as a strange, amusing anecdote. So did I, honestly. But then I met Morel. We were on a date, can you imagine? She tells me a story. And it's the most detailed report of the Insulindian phasmid I've ever heard. The sounds. She told me it hissed. It did, yes. Like reeds in a gust of wind. The way it moved, the color. How some of its limbs were white, like marble. It matched perfectly with what I know from other accounts. It was amazing. How to pick up chicks, or how to pick up dudes, I guess. Find a cryptid, tell it at parties, tell it on your date. You'll never know what you're gonna get. If it weren't for Lena, I would have given up hope years ago. It's no exaggeration to say that she restored my faith in my profession. You were on a date? Our first, yes. The old woman looks at her husband tenderly. The glance is tender, yes, but tempered by something else. A thought she can't express. Even to him. Interesting. Its limbs are white? Not all of them. There is some white coloration reported, along with beige, where the camouflage ends. How big was it? It's hard to say how big things are when you're quite small yourself. To me, it seemed to be taller than I was then, but that's probably not the case. Kim, what do you think of this? I thought it was a wonderful story, man. He closes his notes and gives a simple, her a simple smile. But I don't believe it. A child left unattended on a warm day. Children make up stories and then end up believing them. Thank you for sharing this with me. I'm not going to tell her she imagined it. I believe her. You're welcome, sweetie. I do appreciate the chance to relive it whenever I get one. It was just... Such an impossibly sunshiny day. So warm. And she could get up a walk, right into the reeds on her own, into the mud, anyway. Let's see. Maybe you could convince her to tell you about some cool cryptids? There's really no yes. point in manipulating anyone. She'd be only too pleased to tell you about her work. Go on and ask. Hey, Lena, I'd like to hear about some of the cryptids you've studied. Could you tell me just about a couple of them? Oh, I'd be delighted. <laughs> Truth be told, I could really use the company too. One cryptid, not a couple. One. Oh, okay. This won't turn into some kind of cryptid extravaganza. Kim, you're so boring! Okay, Kim, just one little cryptid, promise. He nods and assumes a waiting posture. Cryptids, cryptids. Let's hear about all the interesting cryptids. Ooh, tough choice there. What's the tiniest cryptid? Cryobacter catlensis. Cryobacter catlensis? Yes, a unicellular bacterium that was discovered in one of the northernmost points of Kotla on the Boreal Plateau by renowned geologist Caitlin Mijanu some 70 years ago. What's so special about it? Bacterial colony Mijanu found had remained alive while frozen in ice for longer than anyone could reliably estimate. Certainly from before recorded history, Mijanu disappeared shortly after injecting herself with the bacteria she had brought back to study. No doubt in hopes of prolonging her own life. Wait, she injected herself with it? Yes. The bacteria had survived in the ice since times immemorial. 
it's not hard to see where she could have gotten the idea. Girl, you crazy. It's actually a little hard to see, but do go on. You mean there's an immortal geologist wandering the world? Yes, and she's quite mad, too. After she treated herself with the bacteria, she stopped aging, but also became increasingly eccentric and irascible so that even her oldest friends were forced to pull away. We can assume that she has been living somewhere in the wilderness for decades now, all alone except for the cryobacter catlensis coursing through her bloodstream. Oh boy, I get to keep asking. Is this bird a cryptid? Point to the tie she gave you. No. It's the cryptid. Wow, the cryptid? Oh yes. Okay, but what is this bird? The eight-eyed teratorn, the largest flying avian ever discovered with a wingspan of 11.5 meters. It was thought to have gone extinct 3,500 years ago. Some even doubted the fossils were real. A mutation, they said. Until... Mutation. All of evolution is a mutation. Until? Until it was sighted by renowned Gottwaldian explorer and naturalist Uwe Plattenkau in 21. I need to hear about the sighting. It happened on a botanical expedition into the vast and unexplored Wambau Canyon in southeast Ilmara. Dr. Plattenkalk got separated from his group during a sandstorm. Okay, and Uamaro is... The world's Maru. largest canyon system, sweetie. It's a barren waste east of the Erg Desert. Erg. An ancient riverbed, completely dried up. I liked that Erg, Erg, Erg. Yeah. <laughs> what happened? Alone, in the blasted desert heat, the doctor wandered eastward where man hasn't stepped foot in over a thousand years since the fall of Pericarnassus. He was lost without any navigation equipment and desperately low on water. After a day or two, he noticed a bird high in the noon sky. A great black bird, it seemed gargantuan. Every now and then, the bird would dive down to feed on an animal carcass somewhere on the horizon. By the time Uva got there, the Teratorn had taken off already, and the carcass was picked clean. This happened many times. He was following it? Yes, or rather, hunting. A bird that big has a lot of blood in him, and he was dying of thirst. For many days, Dr. Plottenkalk followed the Teratorn until they reached a great canyon wall where the bird finally landed to rest. Professor climbed up there, the rock in his hand. He found the bird sleeping with its head tucked under its wing, a great black pile of feathers on the perch. So he approached, slowly squeezing the rock in his fist. Then the Teratorn suddenly looked at him. He could see it had eight eyes, four on either side of its skull, like a spider. And the man couldn't move, he was paralyzed frozen into place with the rock in his hand. Whatever he did, he could not get closer to the bird. Why? The bird was controlling his mind. It kept him from approaching. He could step back. Every time he stepped forward, paralysis. Uva spent three days trying until the bird flew away. Hold on, how did he survive to tell the story? The eight-eyed Teratorn was indifferent to him, as long as he didn't get closer than two steps. It even let him feed on some carcasses up there, and the two unfertilized eggs it left behind. An eight-eyed mind-controlling bird. Fuck yeah! Absolutely, sweetie. Cryptozoologists have been tracing it ever since, but Wamrao is vast, mysterious, and holds many secrets. Modern radar telemetry shows great promise. We will confirm this one by the end of the decade, latest. This one, like, not only does it have eight eyes and is a living fossil and the largest bird ever to live, it also does mind control. Hell yeah, Kim! He's sincere. He likes the audacity of it. 
So was that that was the last anyone saw of it? Sadly, yes. But there are numerous reports of eight-eyed bird skulls from Il Mara. And then there's the striking resemblance to the Periconassian Imperial Eagle, an ancient heraldic symbol that is hard to pass off as coincidence. The Imperial Eagle, too, had eight eyes. Not really. It's just stylization. The way they drew eyes. It's not a zoological drawing. Very, very hard. This one's very famous. Everyone knows it. People will be looking at that tie on you and thinking that man is into cryptids. So, what else do you want to know? What's the biggest cryptid? Hey, you promised you'd only ask about one cryptid. But Kim, don't you want to hear about another cryptid too? The lieutenant pauses thoughtfully. Ah, oh, fuck it. Let's have more. Yeah, Kim. Yeah, let's fucking go. Well. Yeah. <laughs> of course, the horrible giant of Kokonur. The giant lives in the most arid parts of the vast Kokonur desert in South Samara, casting a strange light across the barren wastes. Wait, what do you mean a strange light? A mirage or a psychogenous luminance. She does not elaborate the nature of this luminance further. And just how big is it? No one knows for sure. It is like an awful mountain appearing from below the horizon and expanding to cover almost a third of your field of vision. Is it dangerous? The towering luminosity of Kokonur is a bad omen in local folklore. Some say it's a Fata Morgana, others, fate unimaginable. Who are you? No animal can be that large. It's a mirage. That's what makes it so peculiar. A species surviving at the very limits of scientific law. The giant Hi, Kokonur must be the largest animal the planet can support. There are limits, you see, to how large a metabolism an ecosystem can beget. Some say a gravity anomaly below the Kokonur desert might allow the creature to grow to these gargantuan sizes. We're learning about cryptids. I'm having a great time. Kim said we could only ask about one, but then he said it's okay. We can ask about more. Great. This is great shit. You need more. Hell yeah. Gravity anomaly. Digging it. Digging this parascientific stuff right here. What's the most dangerous cryptid? The gnome of Jeroma. The gnome of Jeroma? That doesn't sound too bad. Oh, it is. None of his victims survived. Grieving relatives never even found their bodies because the gnome's venom dissolved organic tissue. Yeah, he's totally into it. He's not into it. I think he's just humoring me. He's letting me have a little field day. <laughs> what did this cryptid look like? It was reportedly a small creature with wet fingers and a protruding forehead and a gangly little thing. Quite scary to look at. A couple of campers found it when it was already dying. They heard an odd wailing in the woods and followed the sound. They were scared and wrapped it in tarpaulin to suffocate it. It still took the gnome of Jeroma an entire day to die. If the body of the creature was found, why aren't there detailed illustrations of it in science textbooks confirming the existence of this very little species? Yeah, I could be I could be crashing my police car into things. I, this is great. Alas, the first scientist who got his hands on the creature's corpse put it in a jar of formaldehyde thinking that would detoxify the gnome's venom. Instead, all the venom leaked out of the creature's teeth and into the surrounding liquid, dissolving the creature itself. A poetic end, perhaps, but a real loss for science. Is that a cryptid on this pen you gave me? Take out the pen she gave you. Yes. It's the kind green ape. Half war story, half undiscovered species in the genus Homo. War story? Yes, it was reported by soldiers in South Safra during the war. 
The kind green ape would visit bunkers during the night, healing wounded soldiers with its saliva. Wow, with its saliva? Yes, it has amazing healing qualities. Some soldiers reported growing back limbs, regaining their sight. And there was something about an undiscovered subspecies of man? Indeed, there is. It's our closest relative among the cryptids. Same taxonomic family, different genus. Which is to say, the kind green ape is a species with which we share a common ancestor, and that evolved parallel to our own. Just like your partners. I'm pretty sure Kim is the same species as us, as to suggest otherwise is stupid. The lieutenant looks at you pleasantly surprised. I think she just means races, like developing as different races. Oh. No, I didn't mean to imply that Saolites are inferior to us in many ways. You are superior. For example, your earwax doesn't have a foul odor like ours does. A tremendous evolutionary advantage, I'm sure. But perhaps we've had enough speculative biology for today. Are there any invisible cryptids? What an interesting question. And the answer is yes, there are. Of course. All fairy tales have someone or something invisible in them. Shush, Kim. She's gonna tell me about the invisible cryptid. What is it? It's the cult de Mama Dakwa. Its name means thin whisper of sound, and that's precisely what it is. Self-replicating sound waves, invisible and intangible. The cult de Mama is very afraid of us, which makes it incredibly difficult to track. What does it um sound like? Like nothing. It's such a high-pitched sound that us humans can't hear it, nor can other animals. It could be ringing right outside your window, and you wouldn't even know it. it could be anywhere. Everywhere, even. Like the thing in the church? Fine, I'll buy it. How can an animal be a sound? Many scientists have asked the same question. Some have claimed that it isn't itself a sound, but a tiny corpuscle that emits sound waves. But there's no evidence to support this theory. Whoops. Could it be here? Look around right now? It could be. As I said, it could be everywhere. And we wouldn't know any better. It could be ringing all the days of our lives and nights. What evidence is there of this animal being a sound? Plenty. It's the evidence that led to its discovery. In the 20s, a group of aerial pagi ornithologists, that is, scientists who study birds, were trying out a new recording technology for capturing sounds outside the range of human hearing. When playing back recordings they had made in the foothills of the Ea mountain range, they noticed certain anomalies Patterns that seemed random at first, but on closer examination, were consistent with the waveforms of songbirds. Just not eagerly. The scientists soon discovered they could track and even predict what appeared to be feeding, mating, and migration patterns based on sound waves in a strictly delimited range of ultrasonic frequencies, even higher than those of the highest pitched bat calls. They realized that they had discovered a new species and called it the Col de Mama Daqua, after the Paracanassian name for the Voice of God, which is said to be very silent. Wow. Mm -hmm. They grew quite obsessed with these little birds. Even though they couldn't see them, they could distinguish among individual birds and even began to name some of them. Name them? Sequester, Time, Joss Can. Those are but some of the Mama Dakwa they followed individually. Why is the Mama Dakwa so afraid of us? That is a sad story. A group of university students assisting with the field work in their enthusiasm for the project, and no doubt because they were preoccupied with impressing their professors, nearly drove it to extinction. Extinction? They tried to communicate with it and had no other means but sound. So they started sending out sound waves at frequencies they thought might match the Mama Dakwas. 
And what happens when a sound wave meets another sound wave at the same frequency, dear? I don't know. Well, dear, they cancel each other out. And these tests were performed so recklessly that when they happened upon the right frequency, well, they wiped out most of the population. Great regret washes over her. A wending cloth. After that, the corpuscle appears to have migrated elsewhere. There have been recordings of anomalies similar to those spotted in Ea, but they've been few and far between. It's impossible to confirm the presence of any stable Kaltamama Dakwa population anywhere. Of course. A common thread in these. Disappearance and unfalsifiability. Shut up, Kim. I like the story, though, man. I'm glad you did, dear. Interesting. What about... What about what? Man, I just can't get enough of these cryptids. I'm glad you like them. But I'm not really one to tell you about all of them. You should ask my husband if you get the chance. He's the real expert. That's all for now, ma'am. Alright, man, I got bad news. Why are we walking uh, uh, over there? Nothing like the gratitude of a good woman. Now then, what can I do for you? He gives you a gruff pat on the so shoulder. He tries to play it cool. Remain professorial. But inside, this man is itching for some news on those traps. So I checked all the traps. Good. Okay. And? And one of them was empty. Completely empty? Yes, there was nothing in the trap. No locusts, no phasmid. No locusts? No phasmid either? That's not ideal, but... The empty trap was the one at your campsite. Maybe this factors into it somehow? I definitely left that one stocked. Mm. Right from the campsite? Just means the Insul Indian phasmid is even more clever than we thought. Of course. More clever. Shut up, Kim. Yes. The Phantasmodea picked up the locust and escaped. This is good news. Though we'll have to reconsider the design of the traps. Make them more secure. Another trip to the reeds. Yes, that's exactly what it is. What a deft hunter this phasmid. Of course. Be sarcastic. Unless you have an alternative hypothesis you'd like to venture. Mine stands. Okay? Actually, no. Excuse me for getting emotional. This is a big deal for us. You've helped us twice now. And brought some great news too. My gratitude and the gratitude of the Societe Cryptozoologique de Ravishaw is yours. Heartfelt gratitude. But does it feel like closure? What really? Thank you, it's an honor. We should probably return to our main investigation here. This has been a refreshing but... Helping cryptozoologists isn't really a priority for our organization, is it? The lieutenant looks out the window, impatiently. Damn it, lieutenant. Have you no intellectual curiosity? Oh, we save in here. I'll get going. We're gonna find that damn locust. Or stick bug or whatever the fuck it is. Hello. Lena and I were just his Consider the yes. way the empty trap was disturbed. As though shaken. Most likely the hands of a young person. Hands small enough to fit inside the trap, too. You should ask the red headed boy. Kuno. Kuno. I think a little hooligan called Kuno may have stolen the locusts. A little hooligan? But what would a child want with that? Who fucking knows what Kuno wants with them? He's probably eating them. Oh my dear Morel. You've been an old man for too long. Kids love to torment insects almost as much as they love to torment old folks. I'll talk to the little gremlin and see if anything comes up. Delinquents. My favorite. It doesn't sound like it's really his favorite. Oh, you've been such a dear to us. Please, let us know whatever you turn up. I have a feeling we're getting so close. Well, 
I see you've got all the help you need. I'll see you tonight at my place. Let's play suzerainty, but no more field trips for me. After this is your last chance to talk to Gary. Really, Gary? We're getting somewhere here. I'd love to play suzerainty, but... Lena, I'm sorry, but you're not getting anywhere. It was some kids. I know the little mutants around here. Leave anything out in the open and they'll steal it. Even if it's bugs. He looks at his tea. Morel, it's been fun. Really. But I need a bath and I have deliveries to handle. When this tea is done, I gotta run. No, no. No need to apologize, Gary. You'd be more than helpful. We'll have to take a rain check on that game of Sue's rain tea today, though. We're gonna follow this route. I'll get going. Is that you, Gary? It's always a pleasure to see an officer of the. I mean, officers. Okay. I don't like you, Gary. Kuno! You little shit, you're fucking with the investigation. You wee bastard. Was that? Could it be? The Koldamama Dakwa? No. It's probably just your imagination. Ringing. Is it? Is there a ringing? There seems to be an extremely high pitched ring. Ultrasonic. Lena said it was very high pitched, right? It's like something tickles your ear. Honestly, your ear isn't hearing a whole lot. The distant hum of the industrial harbor, the traffic. But, admittedly, there is a high-pitched noise somewhere there, too. But then, isn't there always? Wait, Kim, do you hear a high-pitched noise? No, I don't hear the Koldomama Dakwa. <laughs> neither do you. You don't have to be so mean about it. Of course he doesn't. He's deaf. <laughs> Listen closely first. There it is again. You're about to rediscover a long-lost species. It must be very close. Maybe, just maybe, it will come toward you. Move your head towards the sound. Oh no. The sound. It's moving away. Somewhere over there. Go after it. No. Too late. It's gone. There is no ringing anymore. Just the sound of the streets. No, come back, please. Keep your ears peeled. If the species really has migrated to Martinez, you're sure to hear it again. Kuno! Jamais vu derealization. Jamais vu, the opposite of deja vu. Not already seen, but never seen. Everything that should be familiar appears strange and new, like some half forgotten day in your childhood only now that's the feeling you've been having and for who knows how long you should go and ask Joyce Messier about this what world are we in this is a fundamental question one plus XP for every orb clicked all intellect learning caps raised by one cool How much, how many points do I have? I got three. Yeah. <laughs> Kuno! I hate you! Kuno's like Kuno's dad? Kuno doesn't give a fuck about Anything. You wouldn't happen to know anything about missing locusts. No, 
Kuno doesn't give a fuck about books. So he knows locusts are bugs. Oh my god, I told you that shit is name. Shut up, see. Now they're gonna take you to Lane Prison. She sounds like she's about to cry out of disappointment at Kuno's newfound lameness. Now hold on, no one is lame here. Just tell me what happened. Deny everything, Kuno. You need to lawyer up. She's right. Kuno's not gonna say anything without his lawyer present. There's definitely something going on here. Remember his pig's head shack? You should check it out. Okay. Kuno doesn't fuck. Shut the fuck up, Kuno. Go in your shack. It's calling with locusts in here. All around you, the hisses and chirps of locusts fill the musky air. The earthen floor of the shack has been shaped into mounds of mud dotted with little holes for windows. Like skyscrapers, spires of dirt and sand rising. Accommodations for their insectoid inhabitants. Well, detective, it appears you've solved the case. Lieutenant looks around, writes something in his notebook, and turns to you. Of the locusts. For the missing locust case, which is a subcase of the imaginary insect case. So at least that's going well. Stop being so sarcastic, Kim. Oh, I'm not being sarcastic at all. We are making real progress here. <laughs> when someone says they're not being sarcastic, it's usually a good sign that they're being very sarcastic. You think the Insulandian Phasmid is nearby? If anything, the presence of the Locust points to the opposite. The Phasmid did not take the bait from the traps. It was Kuno. The Phasmid doesn't exist. But what do I know? We should talk to Kuno about this, get him to stop. I'll let you handle the Kuno side of things. You are doing just fine. Alright. Kuno, we found the locusts. You were in huge trouble, you're going to lame jail. You're going to fucking lame jail, man. Mm mm. Kuno's like Kuno's dad? Kuno doesn't give a fuck about anything. I know you took the locusts from the traps the cryptozoologist set up. Yeah. Kuro took the books. So what? So it wasn't the phasmid. A wave of disappointment washes over you. You said you don't give a fuck about bugs, then you go and build a whole bug town. It's not bug town. It's the city of locusts. Locusts aren't just bug shit. They come out of the sky like a fucking shadow. Shit descends. She wails from behind the fence and then buries her face in her hands. You stop! It's like they're fucking night. Local city. Night city. City of rage. There's a tug of war over the name of this fantastical Kuno city. Kuno is going to it's look so stupid, stupid when we die and our corpse gets more bugs than his stupid bug town. Heh. <laughs> yeah, he's gonna look real dumb. The girl forces herself to watch again. The corners of her eyes twitching from discomfort. City of Rage sounds like a cool place. Kuno, the pig wants to help you. Oh, that's how lame it is. Please just don't say you're an artist. Maybe I am an artist. You hear that, everyone? I'm a fucking artist now. Did he just say I? Kuno usually calls Kuno Kuno. That's great, Kuno. It's cool to make art. He tears at the buttons of his shirt, trying to rip them open. They don't give way. Kuno made himself into Kuno. Kuno can make himself into anything. Kuno can make himself into a pig if he wants. Kuno can make himself into a. Kuno doesn't give a shit. Don't make yourself into a pig, Kuno. You'll have to take me away. A leaden silence fills the yard. In it, you hear snow melting, dripping from the eaves. Someone closing a window. That depends on the choices you make, young lady. Without a word, she disappears entirely behind the fence. For once, the boy is lost for words. 
He turns completely red now, with splotches of white beginning to appear across his face. Use this momentary confusion to take control of the situation. I need you to stop taking the locusts from the trap. The cryptozoologists are trying to find something very important. Those locusts are bait. I don't give a shit. I don't need the locusts anyway. Shit is all lame now. She was right. The girl's face appears again above the fence, just long enough to make eye contact with Kuno. She doesn't know whether to be glad because Kuno's finally convinced of the lameness, or more worried because of his continued use of the first person singular. Kuno is Kuno, not I. Okay, now that that's settled, I better be off. The fuck are they trying to catch anyway? With the traps? The Insulandian Phasmid. Oh. He mutters to himself. He recognizes the name. Wait, you know what the Insulandian Phasmid is? I just think Kuno doesn't know shit. The fuck out of here. Kuno's tired of this shit. There's silence between the two children. They're not saying anything to each other, nor looking in each other's direction. Thanks, Kuno. What's, what's this? This trash container is locked. The sliding lid has a padlock that says, whirling in rags. There's something in there, not necessarily connected to the case, but still. Why am I looking at you, trash container? You're just a trash container. Well, it is a container. Maybe you're prioritizing it. Lieutenant, what do you think could be in here? Trash, food waste from the cafeteria. They lock these containers to keep the derelicts from flocking in. Could be evidence too. Yes, I feel like there's something in there. What do you mean, feel? It's extrasensory perception. Whatever is in there holds special significance. I agree. We should get someone from the remote viewers division here. He's being sarcastic. Do not ask what the remote viewers division is. There's no need for sarcasm. I just feel strongly about it, that's all. Maybe it's not connected to the case, but still. Oh. It might also be evidence. The mob could have disposed of something in there. We should get it open. How do we get the lock open? We could try using a pry bar. The one we took from my motor carriage. Or, Lieutenant? Or we could ask for a key from the manager of the Whirling in Rags. He probably has one. Okay. Yeah, I guess I just never found the container. <laughs> Kuno's gonna have a fucking heart attack! How do I get up there to that lady? I want to talk to that lady, but I never figured out how to get up there. Hello, Whirling in Rags manager. Do you like me now that I've given you a new bird? Hmm? You friends with Velvet? Yes. Hey, was there something you needed? Well, well. Bringing in that new bird sure made a difference in his attitude. Is the trash container out back yours? Mine? No, it belongs to the Whirling in Rags. Thank you for clearing the up. Why do you keep the container locked? Why? To keep the hobos and drunks out. That's why. And the neighbors too. They put their trash there, and they don't pay for the garbage company. I thought as much. And are you the only party with access to the trash container? Well, yes. Us and the garbage disposal company. It seems a little callous, doesn't it? Something stirs in me. I wonder what this feeling is. Product him and find out. We need those keys. What do you need them for? To dig through the trash, duh. It concerns the case. Please cooperate. Just bring them back once you're done, please. Hold on, I think I hear the sound of a cat. Venus? Okay. <laughs> Goodbye. Maybe it has the secret to this door. Oh, what's this? The cook isn't here. <laughs> Stealing. Feline superstar, yes, Venus Weenus. My mom hates when I call her Venus Weenus. She's like, stop! It sounds like penis! Like, yeah, that's the joke, mother. That's why it's haha -ha funny. 
This trash container is locked. Open the padlock with the key. With a well oiled crack, the lock pops open. It should now be possible to simply raise the lid. Don't. Maybe you shouldn't. Maybe you shouldn't. Of course you should. This is your time to shine, Hobo Cop. Dive into that dumpster for extra content. Open the lid! The smell of rotten food rises to greet you. You see soggy cartons, dirty rags, and organic waste. We're just in time. This hasn't been emptied for over a week. Dig in Hobo Cop style for extra content! Wow. An armistice caliber 50 knock cannon. Half wrapped in paper tissues. So shiny. What's a knock cannon? It's a giant rifle, and it's very expensive. Not as expensive as that fat string of pearls snaking around the rotten banana peels, however. And is that Cordon Electric's preamp with Electra F2 tubes? It is. That catches quite a price. We're talking 12,000. Easy. Unless you're into hi-fi yourself. I'm into hi-fi. That's too bad, because none of those things are actually in there. There's just food waste and crisp wrappings. A cruel jest. There must be something. All you see is a broken mug with a racist depiction of the yellow man frolicking in saffron. An antique? Only in its social sensibility. Take the mug. Mm -hmm. Look under the boxes of carton. You see milk and egg rest with one broken egg in it. Some pasta wrapper. Picking up the soggy packages somehow feels familiar. A box falls into pieces in your hands. Batiste Sole cereal. There are plastic pasta packages below. And turbo noodles. Nothing of note, however. Pick at the rags. Among the threadbare kitchen towels, something catches your eye. A pair of denim trousers. Grab them. As the legs of the slime-covered jeans begin to unspool from the garbage, a rank corpse smell fills the air. They stole his pants. Are these the victim's clothes? The smell is not nearly as bad as the cadaver. These clothes could not have been in contact with the deceased for more than two days after his death. Cadaver in Odor is faint. If these belong to the deceased, they were removed when he was still in the early stages of decay. Drop them in here, officer. Bag the trousers. Guitar mark, blue jeans. Pockets. Empty. Or empty. He wore them with a belt, too. A white belt. The loops appear stretched, but... He looks into the container. The belt is missing. That's it. Do you see anything else in there? I have another bag here. Something slimy catches your eye. Reach for it! A drab, long-sleeved shirt, olive-colored, appears from the food waste, dripping with pus. Bag the shirt. This is a military type of a garment. No label or serial number. This is the kind of red meat shirt that's worn over light armor to conceal it in an urban scenario. Anything more? The rest of the rags are just kitchen variety waste. Just garbage. That's all I think. All right. We should go to Gart again and ask if he knows who put the clothes in the trash. It could be as simple as someone from the hosted king in the yard. Or that one. I'd advise against confronting that force. You think someone from the Whirling might have been involved, maybe? Not really. All we know is the victim's clothes are in the trash. The lid was locked, and this establishment had the key. It's just a small loose thread. Yeah, we need to ask the kids who put them here. The fuck's he on about? Kids? You hear that, Kuno? He thinks you're an infant or something. See? Okay. The lieutenant nods, then looks back into the trash container. Search the food waste. It's just organic waste, cold and slimy on your hands. Apple and potato peels, mostly. Unidentified sludge and the occasional chicken bone thrown in for good measure. But hey, nothing. It's nothing. Nothing more to see here. What's this? What? A blue piece of plastic sticks out from the apple peels. It's shiny. Looks like the corner of something. Pick it out. Something larger. A clipboard. A blue plastic clipboard with moist papers hanging from it. They look badly damaged, but you can still make out forms and notes written in a man's handwriting. What makes a handwriting a man's handwriting? Officer, 
Is that your paperwork? No, it can't be. <laughs> yes, it is. Look. This plastic has the RCM's tree breed on it. You've even got an autopsy form. A miserable slicking slip of paper sticks to the board. If you don't mind me asking, how did this get in the trash? Let's see. I think I didn't want to be a cop anymore, so I threw it away. Well. He doesn't know what to say. His eyes express a rare condolence. Then he picks it up. Lucky we found it. You should take stock of what remains, just to be sure some has not made it into the hands of the RCN's adversaries. Organized crime and the like. There might have been police secrets in your notes. Okay, I'll do that. It would also not hurt to start taking notes on the case. Now, tell me what your eagle eyes see. Or are we finished? Some items, such as the ledger you found, are interactable. Go to your inventory and select the interact tab to read your paperwork. Close the lid. The container sounds a muffled gong. Oh, well, that was productive. That's one thing of the least. I think we got it all. See. It's the legend found in the trash. A pitiful cabbage of white and yellow papers hanging from plastic board, barely held together by a metal clip. This sad display is made complete by the faint smell of urinal cleaner. God damn it. Anything else? <laughs> There's a piece of toilet paper. Or is it cleaning tissue? No, it's toilet paper. Desperately sticking to the back of the blue plastic clipboard. It's a metaphor for you. Leave me alone. Thank you, Waterlocked Ledger, for spelling it out for us. Below the pathetics, terror. Do not look into its blue heart. Inspect the toilet paper. It's just toilet paper. Stick it to the back of the plastic clipboard. You can take it off if you want. Take it off. Still wet, the toilet paper peels off the plastic easily. All you have to do is shake it off with your finger and voila, the ledger now looks marginally better. Inspect the clip. An aluminium block runs the width of the board, biting down on the paperwork. Its crocodile teeth are the only thing keeping the papers together. A regular pencil, the tip worn down to nothing, has been attached to the clip. Run your fingers across the aluminum. The surface is interrupted by a silvery sticker. It's rectangular, sparkling with iridescence. You don't know how you didn't notice it before. Looks like an official mark, made to be low visibility outside the right circumstances. Lieutenant, is this one of those hologram watermarks you mentioned? Point to the sticker. What? Yes, uh, allergen watermark used for adding information to our scene property. Interesting, what kind of information? It depends, aside from an anti-counterfeiting stamp. Mine has my station number and address. The information varies by date of issue. How many years you've been on the force? He's thinking. It'll have that. How can I... God damn it. How can I read it? Any capable light with the right wavelength will do. Like, for example... All RCM vehicles have had lights designed to review halogen watermarks. Mine too. This means you can read the watermarks if you just turn the lights on. That's all. Thank you. Okay. He returns to his neatly kept, kept notes. While a bunch of sodden papers sag from the clipboard in your hand, it's a sorry sight. Browse the white papers. They're not exactly white. They're yellowed in patches by sunlight and alcohol and covered in dense blue handwriting. Ink escapes into watercolor patterns, reaching its tendrils across entire pages. The paper itself is checkered with faint red lines forming short paragraphs. Once in a while, there's a red stamp that exclaims, Case files commit to paper. 
The case files themselves are plenty. You count more than a hundred sodden, crumpled up, earmarked pages falling apart in your hands. They appear to be sufficiently organized and extremely dense, if mostly illegible. What is in there? What are they about? Work, strife, poverty, the Jamrock Quarter. These are handwritten logs of investigations dating back to January 51, this year. The exact number is hard to estimate, due to missing pages and an odd naming convention. But there are at least 20, maybe 30 cases undertaken, not completed, mind you. It's the middle of March. You have attempted two cases a week on average. Is two cases a week a good case, though, Lieutenant? Huh? Two complex cases to undertake is a lot, yes. You really have to push yourself. I would not suggest it, lest you start making mistakes. Two cases a week appears to have been my load, Lieutenant. I'm not sure I completed them, though. Two? That's a lot. I didn't mean to say you are making mistakes, by the way. It was presumptuous of me. I burned out all right. That's okay. We all do, sooner or later. Like a fan of girls, the checkered papers dry in your hand. The handwriting is extremely dense, if mostly illegible. There was a mention of a naming convention here? Yes. It appears you employ a, shall we say, robust yet literary system. Each investigation has its case number written on the margins. Yet, still more tellingly, most are accompanied by a name. A title, one might say even. One that draws inspiration from snoop fiction and Vespertine cop show statements. Oh my, and they're written in capital letters too. Yes, all caps. One is called The Next World Mural. Another, The Square Bullet Hole Murders. Another yet, The Unsolvable Case. More? Others appear more lighthearted. The guys on a couch in an unexpected location and the murder at the Uka parlor. Even the rare article free collapsing tenement. Murder features prominently throughout. It's going to take an effort to piece these case files together, but it can be done. Once Kim. you're done inspecting them up close. Kim, my cases appear to employ some kind of naming convention. You mean the alphanumeric? Officer, precincts, time of arrival at the scene? No, I mean a non numeric one with titles. Oh, you mean the titular? Yes, well. So do I. In our defense, almost everyone in the RCM does. Why is that? It's a holdover from the early days of the RCM, right after the revolution, when the organization had little idea how to do things. It persists in an unofficial capacity. Officers use these titles to refer to their work among themselves. I seem to have named a case the Square Bullet Hole Murders. Again, in your defense, I seem to have named one the man with the hole in his head. That was a real person. His death was real. Still, I named it that. To amuse myself. I pray his loved ones never find out. What happened to him? Rail spiked through the head. He died. It was a workplace accident. Count the pages. I have to open an official case. Is there room? There is, for precisely one more. Fifteen pages near the end remain untouched by the damage. The checkered grid forms a structure of passages breaking the case into subtasks to accomplish. Commit to paper using the pen Lena gave you. The tasks you've completed flow out of the kind green ape pen in a brash freehand similar to the rest of the letters. The wording comes easily. It's almost robotically simple. A language developed for mental rigor and simplicity. Inspect the victim's body. Get the body down. Interview the cafeteria manager. It's not exactly poetry, but poetry would be out of place. Cross out the ones you've already finished. A satisfying slash sounds across the paper. You're done, it seems to say. And you, and you. Things to be done, and things already done. The composition of reality. This is an extremely useful tool for a detective of the citizens' militia. Now all that remains is to name the case. Lieutenant, have you by any chance named our case? No, actually. Any ideas? The Hanged Man. Great. That's great. That's actually what I was thinking, too. The Hanged Man. Good, strong name. 
We have a very good name for the case now. Thank you, Kim. I'm going to start calling it the hanged man. It's good to be sorted with that. I'm done inspecting these. Close the case files. You don't exactly close them. So much as distance yourself from the smelly papers. They're a little Oh, that's Bella. I can hear Bella now. yelling. <laughs> okay, we're gonna put this away for now. I'm tired. Bella, shut the fuck up. Bella, come here. I'm gonna save. And we're gonna look for somebody to raid. Let's see here. Da, 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 da. Oh, let's raid Chris. He's playing Pal World. All right, team. Thank you for joining me. I do appreciate it, and I'll see you next time. Bye bye.